more informal that way. Um, hello folks, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I want to thank Nathan, thank Creative Mornings for having me, and thank Bayardstown uh, Social Club. This is one of the first places I came upon um, getting, getting into Pittsburgh uh, last year, last fall, and I thought this was a, an amazing uh, location, so it's awesome to be here. Okay, so the theme of magic is a, is a whole lot of fun, um, and it's it's a really kind of um, stimulating topic, uh, you know, to base a talk on. And since I am in one of the only professions where you actually have a magic wand, and I'm going to get my magic wand out here. <laughs> I thought I'd start with with this thing. So this is a conducting baton. And how many conductors are in the room or out here? Do we have any conductors? Do we have anyone that even took like a conducting class in like high school or do we have any musicians? Let's oh, okay, we have a lot of musicians. Oh, it's amazing. Okay, so you guys but but no conducting classes in college or anything like that. You got to tell me. Okay, so you're you'll be a whiz at this. All right, I think the first thing I would like to do is have a little conducting lesson if anyone's if everyone's cool with that. Are you guys down with doing that? Okay. So um I'm going to talk about like how I got to you know, where I'm doing and uh, what I'm doing on all that in a little bit. But the first thing is, everyone always asks me, what does a conductor do? Um, any, any, uh, any answers on that? Any guesses? What does a conductor do? What the hell does a conductor do? <laughs> What's the way he holds it all together? Okay, that's like, that's, um, yes, that is absolutely the, the fundamental thing. He starts and he stops the orchestra. He starts them on time. He stops them on time. He keeps them all um, synced up. One thing you have to realize about a symphony orchestra, if you picture a stage, um, you know, it, it might be, you know, 100 feet by 100 feet or something like that, okay? So you've got musicians. You've got the trombones all the way in the back that are, you know, a large distance from the very back of the second violin section, and they can't really hear each other well. So a conductor's job is to keep everything together because they can't hear each other so the music is in time. What else does a conductor do? Anything else? Sorry? He sets the tempo, right. So... Um, unlike electronic dance music, where everything's like 128 BPM or 120 or 130, 140, um, classical music has flexible tempo, which is one thing that makes it uh, so wonderful. So a conductor needs to decide, first of all, what that tempo is, how fast or how slow he'd like it to go, and then he indicates that tempo to the orchestra through what's called his upbeat. So um, just a, another thing regarding tempo, um, back in the kind of the early days of classical music, conductors were much more vague as far as their indications. They would basically just say, usually in Italian, they would say allegro, you know, fast. They would say moderato, which means moderately, largo, you know, slower. And, and there's, that's up to um, infinite interpretation, you know. So allegro can be anything from, we think of things in terms of BPMs right now. Um, so, you know, your allegro can be anything from like 90 to 120 or something like that. So these days, composers, they've, they started to get more and more specific about their tempos, and they would, they would indicate metronome markings, if anyone remembers a little metronome sitting on the piano, if you took piano lessons as a kid. Um, but even when a composer says, I, I know exactly the, the quarter note should be 140 at this spot, it's sort of up to a conductor to interpret that still and say, okay, I know you said 140, but I'm the conductor and I'm the boss here, so I'm gonna take it at 150 or 130, et cetera. So a conductor through his upbeat gives the tempo. So if we've got, let's see, let's, let's try some Beethoven here. You all know this. Yeah, so, oops, this is the wrong one, excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. 
So a conductor, through the in the indication he gives, uh, he sets the tempo. So, bum 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 bum, bum 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 bum. He gives like in that in that preparatory beat. This is a tough example actually because that piece starts with a rest. Um, <laughs> so let's give a better one here. So this is our tempo. This piece. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so he sets a preparatory beat. He gives a beat three before it starts. So three, one, two, three. Okay, so in that breath, he basically indicates the tempo. He also, in that breath, he indicates, I mean, the, the sound quality, the texture, the line, etc. So we're getting pretty detailed on conducting right now. I didn't plan to get this in depth, but all right, I said, I said we were going to do a conducting lesson. So, um, I want to teach you how to conduct some basic beat patterns, okay? Music is, is organized um, into measures, or bar numbers we call them, as you, many of you know. And sometimes there are four beats per measure, sometimes there are three. So I want to talk about conducting in 4-4 four, four time today and 3-4. We're going to start with 4-4, four, four, all right? So um, maybe we'll keep everyone sitting down for this, but at the same time, maybe you should stand up. Are you willing to stand up for your conducting lesson? All right, let's stand up. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to you know, face the front like you guys. So when you're in 4/4 four, four time, all right, basically we call that we we do floor, door, window, ceiling. Okay? So one is straight down. Exactly. And then we go left for beat 2, we go right for beat 3, and uh, then up with beat 4. So it looks like this. 1 2 3 4. 1 2 3 4. Let me see you. I'm telling you, you're going to impress everybody at work today. You're going to say, I know how to conduct. All right? It's floor, door, window, ceiling. One, two, three, four. Like that. Okay? Now, three, four time, conducting in three, is one, two, three. Okay? So basically, we've just taken away the, the one on the left, three, four time. It's one, two, three. One, two, three. All right? So let's go back to four, four. Show me. Ready? Ready? And one, two. Two, three. Yeah, it's pretty good. How's it feel? Can you can you can you imagine the music? All right, let's try three now. Ready? And one, two. Oh, this is pretty cool. Okay, excellent. You guys know how to do it now. So, just a just a. Uh, what else the conductor does besides keep the orchestra in time? Besides indicate the tempo. I mean, you might wonder actually why. Why are there beat patterns? Um, like, why does two need to be here? Why does three need to be here? That's because when a, an orchestral player is looking at his or her music, they need to know where the conductor is in that bar to make sure they're, they're together. So that's why we have this kind of set pattern. I mean, it's, it's so that uh, visually a player, again, a player in the back of the orchestra, just by looking up, you know, just by kind of nodding up for one second as they're playing, they can see where the conductor is in his beat pattern and make sure they're in the right place. Um, what a conductor does besides setting the tempo, starting and stopping the orchestra on time, um, of course, those are just, you know, the menial tasks that, you know, any conductor is supposed to be able to do. The, the better a conductor is, the more he can show. And actually, professional orchestras, especially our magnificent Pittsburgh Symphony, they prefer that you show as much as possible and that you talk to them as little as possible. Um, you know, they, they want to play music. So the great conductors are able to non-verbally show um, almost everything. They show the sound quality, um, you know, whether it's, whether it's sharp or whether it's um, sustained. So I'm going to just play some differences here. This example of Beethoven, you'll hear it's very staccato. It's very, it's very short, these notes. So you would conduct it like this. Very sharp. Okay, as opposed to this conductor who I, I like a lot takes it very sharp, but some, some conductors don't want the notes to be that short. So instead of they, he might be a little more loose with his beat pattern. Okay, and right away a professional orchestra will know, okay, this conductor doesn't like it, those notes to be as short. Uh, if it's sustained, like the, this is all Beethoven, by the way, that I'm, that I'm using. Again, 
a conductor and what he's doing will show the sustain of the line, okay? A lot of conductors in this movement would just use, they wouldn't use the baton because they don't want the sharp ictus of the beat. So they would just, they just use their hands and put the baton down and show this, the sustain of this line. A conductor oftentimes will show the direction of a phrase. So if you're a singer, you know, we've got high points and low points in the line, okay? So a conductor through his, through his gestures th shows and indicates where the phrase is going, where the peak of the phrase is. Um, so there are kind of, in music, you know, obviously we have notes and rhythms and, you know, those, those things are set and, and the composer, you know, through his, um, he indi indicates what those should be, those, the specifics, but then there's an infinite amount of interpretation. That's where the conductor comes in. Finally, I always liken a conductor to a coach. If you assemble some of the best basketball players in the world and put them together, most likely they're going to be able to beat, you know, any other assembly except you know, at the professional level. But when you have an amazing coach, that's when you can kind of do transformative things with that much talent. That's what symphony orchestras of major, con uh, major um, symphony orchestras can do. They can take the top talent, but then can create transcendent performances and, and draw more out of that orchestra than what they could do collectively without some sort of artistic leadership. So uh, before I move on, m questions about conducting or about batons. This is a baton that I actually had made, and it's uh, the maker's in Portland, Oregon, and it's really neat because he puts, he puts your initials in the, the handle, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Questions about conducting before I move on? You guys got it. Yeah. Not just the beat pattern, yeah. Right, so yeah, great question. Sh she's asking if, if the gestures, um, kind of all the extra gestures are taught. Um, no, really in conducting, the beat pattern is pretty much the only thing that is set. And even within a beat pattern, um, there's a ton of variety. Um, and everything else, as far as how you show what, where you want the line to go, how you show the sound quality, that's all individual to the conductor. And you'll have uh, conductors that are, that are extremely gifted physically as far as showing these things. Um, and then you have conductors who really um, are limited as far as their physical gesture, but it's unbelievable how they still um, translate and communicate what they want, whether it's through their face, whether it is through the, what they say. Um, so there's, a, there's just a ton of variety there. There's, a, there's, um, there's many, many ways of getting it done. Ultimately, it's just whether or not the orchestra's playing beautifully and um, and, and delivering wonderful performances. So, yeah. Hmm? Uh, do you cross-train musically? How do you, uh, how do you develop your music after? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I, I studied, w where I studied um, conducting, which at the Curtis, Curtis Institute of Music and at Juilliard, um, my teacher did not teach the physical. He, t he taught the analytical. So here's a, here's a score I'm studying right now. So he was all about digging in to this stuff. Okay, this is getting awkward. You know, dig, <laughs> digging in on the score, um, which of course is the, the first thing you need to do, analyze the music, understand the music. He, uh, he was an old school German um, conductor. He had played under Richard Strauss in Germany. And so he did not um, empower us with the physical gestures, part, partly because he didn't really have them. So he taught us um, how to analyze. He taught us how to listen. Um, some conducting teachers, because you can, of course, get a master's degree in conducting or whatever, which I happen to do. Um, some will teach the physical gestures and really kind of um, arm their students with a physical physical bo vocabulary. Um, for us, you know, you learn a ton by watching. So the music director of the Pittsburgh Symphony is Manfred Honick, who, you know, he played in the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra under the great conductors of the world. So um, just in my first couple of weeks of watching him, I was picking up a ton of tricks because his physical vocabulary is unbelievable. Um, it, you, you were asking sort of how you train for this. Um, I actually do do a lot of um, kind of work in the mirror to see what things are looking like and then analyzing of myself on tape. I'll videotape all my rehearsals to make sure um, I'm communicating and to make sure I'm getting the right results because things will happen in rehearsal 
you know, the Yorkshire won't be together or I won't get the sound that I expected to get or sometimes I, well, in the beginning, sometimes you don't even get the tempo you want. I was saying before, you, you have to start and stop the orchestra together. Well, as a, as a young conductor, you walk up on the podium, sometimes the orchestra says, no, we like our tempo a lot better than yours. So, so they just take their own tempo. So you need to kind of figure out what's going on. You need to figure out how to adjust them. So watching and analyzing yourself is, is a big part of that, for sure. Anything else on, on the conducting thing? Those are good questions. OK. So um, it's interesting to give a whole intro on conducting. Um, I actually, after, I don't know, seven years of training as a conductor, gave up conducting. This was about maybe seven or eight years ago. So um, I was never trained as a serious classical musician growing up. Uh, my parents were not professional musicians. We just had a piano in the house that I started to play. And then in college, uh, I went to uh, undergrad to be a music teacher. I happened to fall in love with classical piano and, and you know, showed some skill in that area. And I had, and I had an incredible teacher who, who encouraged me to follow the performance route. Um, through studying classical piano, I fell in love with the orchestra and started to think, okay, maybe classical conducting is, is the way to go. Maybe that um, you know, suits the skill set I've got. Um, and I really fell in love with the repertoire of classical music. I thought that studying orchestral music, uh, music would um, have me um, sort of absorbed in the greatest music that's ever written. So there can't be anything better than that. Um, so I ended up studying uh, classical conducting went did the, my master's work in that and got a pretty quick start in the conducting business after that. Um, and it only took about a year or a year and a half of doing that to realize that I would never really be completely fulfilled doing that. Um, all the while that I was studying classical music, I was um, involved in popular music, producing, writing, playing in bands, playing in piano bars, arranging, working with different groups. So it was always kind of two parallel tracks. And what I was finding was that the deeper I got in the classical world, the further distanced I felt from popular music. And it's kind of tough to categorize them like that, classical and pop, but you know, the main difference I found was that in classical music, we felt, um, well, we, 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 we felt like, or I felt like we were alienating our audiences. It didn't feel like what I was doing was relevant to contemporary society, really. You know, th some of the, the things that I love about m my favorite artists, like whether it's a Radiohead or a Kendrick Lamar, when an album comes out, it seems to speak to those times. It seems to be immediate and now, and you can relate with it. Um, they seem to be speaking directly to us about issues that that maybe we face um, ourselves or certainly we understand or sympathetic with. In classical music, I did not feel that at all. Now, moreover, I didn't feel like I was playing to my contemporaries. You know, I, I, I think you get into the, in the creative arts, um, creative performance, because you want to, you have, you want to express something, you know, and you, you start probably with expressing that to your peers. And in classical music, I'd walk out onto a stage, and I'd look out, and I wouldn't see anybody my age. And I was about to you know, play a symphony, albeit an incredible symphony, that, but that was 150 years old. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this would have been super hip if, it was, if it's 150 years ago, and I was playing this piece for the very first time. Like That probably would have been something. But as it stood at that point in time, it just didn't, I wasn't feeling a real kind of buzz or electricity. And as a creative person, this was, um, this was very hard to sort of um, wrestle with. So I gave up the conducting thing and kind of walked away from it completely and then went into the pop direction, again, writing songs and doing all that, um, playing out quite a bit. I did that for about a year and a half. And in that year and a half, I realized that classical music was too much a part of me. And so I sort of um, made a decision uh, to combine them. Um, and that that was going to be my goal, to find a way to sort of um, bring that buzz uh, that you feel with popular music when you're in a club seeing a band for the first time, bring that buzz to the concert hall, and bring that incredible repertoire of classical music to my contemporaries. So thus started the journey um, you know, that, I'm, that I'm on right now of, of combining these and, and creating these hybrid works. So... Um, I'm just going to play you an example quick because I feel like I'm talking a lot. I guess that's the, that's the deal. You talk, but, um, you know, it's, it, is a t <laughs> it is a talk after all. But um, 
the first show I did with the Pittsburgh Symphony was uh, called Brahms versus Radiohead. So this was a mashup I did of Radiohead's OK Computer with the Brahms First Symphony. Um, you got to keep in mind, we all know what a mashup is. Well, does everyone know what a mashup is? OK. So if you ask that question to a symphony orchestra, there's going to be two people out of 75 that know what a mashup is, maybe more. And you know, I'm not trying to be disparaging to symphony orchestra musicians, but you got to understand they're practicing the cello or the flute or the timpani all day. You know, and then they're teaching, and they're especially at a at a at a world class level like Pittsburgh. You know, their their job is sort of promoting classical music and making sure it stays alive as an art form. Okay, so they're not hip to what a mashup is. They're not listening to Kanye West. They're not listening to Radiohead. They're doing classical music. So we'll talk in a little bit, I'm sure, about sort of how these pieces are received. But one thing to understand is. I'm trying to apply techniques from the classical or from the popular music world into the classical world, but these musicians oftentimes don't even know what those techniques are, which is which is a difficult place to start from. I'll just say, uh, to say the least. But um, how about a little example of Brahms versus Radiohead? <laughs> Oh, can you see it at all? Kind of? Okay, so we've we've then transitioned right back into Brahms there, where where that left off. So a couple things um, to talk about. We're, you know, our theme is magic. Um, I personally think it's magic when you find the thing that you're supposed to do. You find that place um, that is right for you, where you're using all those different um, talents and skills that make you a unique person. You're putting them to use, and you're and you're doing the thing that only you can do. That's really what I was trying to find with this, and I think that's what any creative person is trying to find. Whether it's Brahms or Beethoven or Mahler or Radiohead, you know these artists are using that all, all their varied experiences, and they're synthesizing them together to come up with their own unique sound. That's that's been you know my goal with this kind of music. So you know Brahms and Radiohead, that's very simple. That represents my my upbringing in classical music and in popular music and synthesizing them. The vocalists that you're seeing out front. Um, when I was in college, I sung in a cappella groups and I've been a singer my whole life. So putting vocalists in front of an orchestra is kind of a, was kind of a dream of mine too. So in in one kind of swoop, this Brahms Radiohead was the it was the first kind of mashup piece I did. It represented a whole lot of who I was as a musician, which was a lot of fun, and that's a magic thing for me. Um, now just to dig into what we just heard, I just want to play. I've got the baton like I'm rehearsing. <laughs> um, so I just want to play some the original pieces and just talk about how these were put together. So here's the original Karma Police. You probably all know the song.
So, um, all right. One of the biggest challenges in putting these two things together, the first movement of this Brahms symphony is in 6-8 time, which is a triple meter. It's 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, like this. Okay, this music, Radiohead's music, is mostly in duple time, which is 4-4 four, four time. All right, there's, there's hardly any triple time. So this piece... Three and four and one and two and three and four. So one of the big challenges in starting this piece, I had this I had an eighteen minute first section of Brahms all in triple meter and I had zero radiohead songs in triple meter. So just the, the rhythm um, was the first thing I really had to wrestle with. So um, thus turning instead of one karma police I had to go dun dun karma police, da, 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 arrest this man, turning it into a, a triple time. So I'm going to go back to what I, my voice sounds really great on, on two hours of sleep. Okay, so <laughs> um, we're going to back it up. So just to, actually, you know what, before I do that, I'm going to play that excerpt of Brahms. So you, you hear what the Brahms originally sounded like, because this is one moment where they're really kind of going on at once. It's Brahms' music that I somewhat adapted and then put the adapted radio headline on top. So in order to meet in the middle, I mean, I was always trying to retain as much of each as possible and then kind of meet in the middle with the synthesis or the mashup. So let's go to the Brahms here. <laughs> Okay, so this is the exact section I started it on. Okay, so that's how Brahms sounded on its own, which is lovely. Again, this is what the current release sounded like. You hear that really clear motion in the bass, the bass line there. Okay, so now, how to put those two together. Let's go back to this down. Okay, so starting it from the same Brahms excerpt that I played when the Brahms was by itself. That section is just new music I wrote that is sort of Brahmsian, uh, that took you know him as used him as an influence, and I orchestrated it and arranged it in a way that I thought he would have arranged it. But it's really Radiohead's melodies and and chords there. So is this making a little bit of sense here? Well, thanks so much f for being here. I hope you um, hope you enjoyed, and hope to see you in uh, at the PSO.